Coming up on Tech News Today, Microsoft earnings, not so bad. Uh, Apple keeps what you say to Siri. Is that a good or a bad thing? And Amazon has 14 TV pilots for you to vote on. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, April 19th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 20 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 30% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code TNT4. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, or online store. Check out their new commerce solution so you can start selling stuff immediately. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT4. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used Samsung Galaxy, iPhone, and other smartphones are worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we take on the top stories in the tech world each day, starting each time with the top 10 of the day in the news feeds. Microsoft earnings weren't bad considering the disaster that is the PC market right now. Profit rose 19% and earnings per share were 72 cents, up from 60 cents last year and beating analyst expectations. Revenue from Windows rose 23%, but most of that was due to revenue that was deferred from the advanced upgrade program last summer. Without that revenue accounted for, sales were essentially flat. Office rose 8% and the server and tools division rose 11%. CFO Peter Klein announced that Microsoft would work with OEMs to come out with small devices soon. Klein also announced that he's leaving Microsoft. No Windows 8 sales numbers were announced. Wired's reporting that Apple has finally explained their data retention policy as it relates to Siri. Voice clips spoken to Siri are stored on Apple servers for up to two years. Apple's Trudy Muller says the company takes steps to ensure that that data is anonymized and only collects the Siri voice clips in order to improve Siri itself. If a user turns off Siri identifiers and associated data, it's deleted immediately. WikiLeaks published a transcript of a meeting between Julian Assange and Eric Schmidt. The conversation dates back to June 23, 2011, when Schmidt was Google CEO and when Assange was under house arrest. The conversation spans five hours and covers a number of topics. Of note, Assange told Schmidt he wouldn't mind a leak from Google regarding data requested under the Patriot Act. The meeting took place because Schmidt was researching a book he is co-authoring with Jared Cohen that will be published on April 23rd. Chinese site 7659 is using Apple's bulk enterprise licensing tool to distribute free versions of the paid App Store applications. The store is geofenced, though, so only Chinese IP addresses can browse it. The bulk license is meant for companies to be able to distribute apps in the workplace without having to involve Apple. 7659 is run by a hacker team known as Kui Yong, which will likely lose their developer account used to provide the apps, but they could easily start another. The first game from Resident Evil creator Shinji Mikami is now official. The Evil Within is the first game from Mikami's Tango Gameworks studio. It's a survival horror game that'll hit PCs, the current generation of consoles, and next-gen consoles next year. A trailer for the game is already available. Speaking during Google's earnings call, Google CEO Larry Page talked about all kinds of things. Page explained the reason why Google went into fiber was because Google co-founder Sergey Brin wanted to show how high-speed internet access could change lives. On Google Glass, Page said that he gets chills when he uses Glass because he thinks of it as a technology of the future. And on Android, Page said that Google's got some ambitious goals for its mobile OS, but he didn't give any details. Cody Kretzinger, who went by the lulz sec name Recursion, was sentenced to a year in prison and 1,000 hours of community service for his breach of Sony Pictures Entertainment's security. Kretzinger pleaded guilty in April 2012 to one count each of conspiracy and unauthorized impairment of a protected computer. 
IBM missed its earnings for the first time in eight years, although it still grew with $23.4 billion in revenue and $3 earnings per share. Chris Whitmore of Deutsche Bank Securities said, The IBM miss is a decidedly negative read through the entire IT hardware segment. Services and businesses grew as expected, with the miss attributed to lost sales and falling demand in software and mainframe markets. Amazon put 14 pilot episodes of television shows from Amazon Studios up on its U.S. website and Love Film in the U.K. for fans to vote on. Among the pilots are an episode of Zombieland, a Silicon Valley comedy called Betas, and a political satire called Alpha House starring John Goodman. There are also six children's shows. Germany will get a chance to see and vote on the shows in the next few weeks. Amazon will take the votes into account when deciding which shows to greenlight for 13 episode seasons. A U.S. District Court decision that said YouTube did not infringe on Viacom's copyrights was affirmed after being sent back to the District Court by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. In other words, YouTube does not owe Viacom a billion dollars for copyright infringement. The court said Viacom did not prove that YouTube was aware of copyrighted material being uploaded to its servers. If you thought this was over, it's not. Viacom says it's going to appeal. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. At Shutterstock.com, you'll find the perfect image or video for your next creative project. Whether it's for your website, a publication, an advertisement, a video, or any other type of project, you can choose from over 20 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips. Shutterstock sources images from around the world, puts them at your fingertips, and they, they use a lot of professional photographers and artists. They review each image individually for content and quality before adding it to its library. And they add 10,000 images a day. So you're going to get high quality stuff. You're going to get lots of it. And you can actually use their incredible search engine to drill down by not just by subject, but by asset type, by gender, by emotion. They have a spectrum tool. You can sort images by color spectrum. A lot of creative teams are using this, and they have a thing called Lightbox that lets you save your images when you find the ones you want to a Lightbox gallery. Then you can access them anytime, share them with other people in your in your, your design team, and decide which ones you actually want to use. Once you figure that out, they've got flexible pricing. You can choose individual image packs or a monthly subscription for the best deal. In fact, you can download 25 images a day with the standard subscription. That's a lot of images. Uh, and you can download them in any size and pay only one price. Uh, like I said, Shutterstock is a global offering. Uh, I find stuff on there all the time. Someone was taking me to test like, I looked at TomMerritt.com. I don't see any images. No, it's a thing. It's a thing.me is where I actually have used a bunch of Shutterstock images because they're gorgeous. So you don't have to take my word for it. You don't even have to look at any of those sites. Just go to Shutterstock.com today. Sign up for a free account. You don't need a credit card. You don't need to do anything. Just start an account. Begin using Shutterstock. Put some stuff in your light box. Do Put that search engine through its paces, and then once you do decide to purchase, use offer code TNT4 because that, on a new account, will give you 30% off any of their packages. That's a big savings. That's Shutterstock.com. For 30% off new accounts, use offer code TNT4. We want to thank Shutterstock for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us today, still recovering from the mysterious missing gallbladder, is Darren Kitchen of Hack5. Still on the lookout, Tom. Um... I'm going to look high and low and near and far. <laughs> Check your doctor. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm just right. guessing. Do you have missing time from sometime last week? Besides I do, actually. I do. I, they, <laughs> they, they actually did the thing where you go to sleep and then you don't remember anything and you're like, oh, man. Well, you definitely look like you're uh, getting back on your feet. So it's Thank good you. to see you good back to be in here the in studio. studio. Uh, let's start off with those Microsoft numbers because everybody's looking at that as sort of a bellwether. Combined with those IBM numbers we heard about in the news views of how the PC market is doing. Now, depending on how you slice this, uh, they're either really good or really average, but they're really not bad. Uh, the upgrade offer thing basically means in the summer last year, they sold people upgrades in advance of Windows 8 coming out, but deferred counting that money until this quarter after Windows 8 came out. So that boosted a lot of the Windows sales. But if you take that out, if you say, well, let's not count that money, Windows sales were essentially flat, and a lot of people expected them to be down. That's not bad. Windows 7, still the most popular. Windows XP, the second most popular. They pointedly did not mention any Windows 8 sales numbers. Now, they might still do that. Computex is coming up. They could do that there. Uh, but... Overall, they're saying, look, we're, we're, we're doing well across the business. Balmer said, the bold bets we made on cloud services 
are paying off. As people increasingly choose Microsoft services, including Office 365, Windows, Azure, Xbox Live, and Skype. Now, you look, look at those IBM numbers as well. They're doing well in cloud services, and there's a rumor that they're going to get rid of the servers and sell them to Lenovo. So it's a cloudy future. Uh, Darren, are you surprised by how well these Microsoft numbers turned out? Well, if you are to believe what Gartner was saying two weeks ago about the death knell of uh, Windows as, as a platform in comparison to, say, like Android, then, yeah, this would be uh, part of their projections that 2013 is the last year of growth and that uh, thereafter you're going to see it really dwindle. And maybe that's why you were saying about the, the kind of interesting accounting that they do there. Um, so, honestly, I don't buy Gartner's prediction, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, it's good to see Windows continuing to do well just because I hope that the PC does well. Well, and that, that's the key, right? I mean, actually, where they're doing well isn't with the PC. They're just doing okay with the PC. Where they're doing well is Azure, Xbox Live. Where IBM was doing well is cloud services. IaaS is... Is this a maybe you could read these as a nail in the coffin of the PC? Uh, well, maybe if you're looking at it that way. If you're looking at PCs as an operating system based system versus a, a personal computing device, Microsoft's on the back end of a lot of these products when it comes to gaming, when it comes to your phones. Even if you're not using something like Windows Phone, you are using some Exchange products. You're always using something that Microsoft's got a hand in. So it might be that Microsoft at some point is going to say, look, you know what, desktops, this was great and everything, and operating systems, that was fine. But we can actually take care of the back end, kind of like IBM was doing before, and just continue to go. Because buying software, box software, is not a th is hardly a thing anymore. So the service-based the service -based thing that they're doing now is probably smartest for its future. If the future for, for big companies like this is in the cloud and they're making that transition, then those companies will do fine. They'll survive. Sarah, is that such a bad thing if PCs become more of a niche market and, and we get better cloud services? Well, no, I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's it just depends on what you as a consumer want to achieve, uh, you know, with your hardware and software solutions. I think Microsoft knows that um, for a lot of folks, uh, cloud is important. Um, they're expanding their suite of services there. You know, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, how Skype numbers might be affected by uh, Android users being able to make Facebook uh, VoIP calls now from from within the Facebook app. That's something that's that just got turned on for Android users um, since our show yesterday. You know, all of that stuff is 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 important for Microsoft, but I, I think it's somewhat telling that we still don't have any concrete Windows 8 numbers. Um, they really, really, really dance around that stuff. And I think that that um, is just kind of indicative of, of, of the way that things are going. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they put out Windows 8 numbers previously when they were mm -hmm. matching them with Windows 7 numbers, saying, hey, it's on, it's on track. In the first month, it sold just as many as Windows 7. Windows 7 was the fastest selling operating system we'd ever met with. Some people criticized that, saying, well, Windows 8 should be selling faster, not the same. Uh, and so I think it is very telling that they just didn't come out with any six-month numbers for Windows 8. Let's move on and talk about uh, Apple finally admitting that they're keeping recordings of your voice when you use Siri. Yeah, Wired had a uh, article yesterday that kind of said, listen, why can't we get a clear answer on this? Uh, had some quotes from uh, representatives from the ACLU saying, we're pretty concerned uh, that, we, that we don't quite understand, you know, when you read Siri's privacy agreement that Apple says it deletes your user data as well as recent things you said to Siri whenever you uh, slide your Siri switch off. But it kind of keeps the older stuff. And what does it mean exactly? Uh, representative Apple uh, from Apple named Trudy Muller um, has told Wired, everything Siri takes in is held for two years. However, that data is not attached to you or your Apple ID or your email address. It's anonymized and only collects the Siri voice clips in order to improve Siri itself. So the way that it works you know, a little granular form as you speak to Siri, you know, you're asking it something or you're asking it to, you know, make you an appointment or you're looking up something on the internet. That's analyzed in a data farm by Apple somewhere. Apple then generates a random number basically to represent you and your query and associates your voice file with that number uh, and no other way to associate you. Once that voice recording, your recording is six months old, Apple then disassociates your user number from the clip, deletes the number from the voice file, but keeps those disassociated files for up to 18 more months to test 
and improve the product. At least you know, that's 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 the answer that uh, that we've gotten. Uh, Mueller said Apple may keep Siri data for up to two years. If a user turns Siri off, both identifiers are deleted immediately along with any associated data. Darren, I know that privacy is important to you. Does this make sense? Do, do, are you are you confident that uh, that that Apple needs to keep this sort of information as long as it's not associated with a user explicitly for this long? Oh yeah, I mean we were just talking about machine learning a few weeks ago, and the more data you can put in, the better service that you can create. And if this is a service that you're opting into, then you would only want them to you know make it better because we've all had that experience with. Uh, any kind of um, spoken word to text translation kind of stuff. Uh, but what it comes down to is we, you're talking about privacy policies. Uh, these things are often intentionally vague. When you think about it, corporations make EULAs and governments make laws. And at least with laws, you can just go and look them up. Uh, EULAs are really hard to decipher and you never really know on the back end, well, are you storing it in an M a weak MD5 hash or are you salting it and using bcrypt? Uh, and, uh, you know, with the laws, like I said, you can look it up, you can find out that the uh, Electronic Communication Privacy Act is not your best friend or, or things of that nature. And, and I feel like if you're really privacy conscious, though, Siri is probably the last year concern. You should probably be more concerned with law enforcement warrantlessly getting, uh, acquiring your SMS messages on your phone and not necessarily Siri. If you're really that concerned, just mask your voice and be like, Siri, what is the weather? <laughs> I asked, what do you think? Uh, I mean, Siri is not a perfect product, at least uh, in, in, my, in my road tests of it. Uh, is this, uh, you know, is Apple doing the right thing here? I think if they're holding on to this data, and they tell you up front, when you use voice dictation on a Mac or you use a Siri on the phone or iPad, it tells you, we're going to send this back to Apple servers. It's one of the reasons why Siri isn't available necessarily, necessarily on offline devices. Uh, they tell you up front, we're going to be uh, looking at your data on our clouds and checking out how this works. Because as you were saying, Siri is less than perfect when it comes to voice dictation. And when you want to actually get information quickly, especially when I, the way I use Siri is usually when it's not convenient to try to type something out or try to dig through application folders. You want it to be as quick as possible. And if it's going to actually improve the product, I think it's fine. On the privacy aspect, I think if you're talking to your phone, talking to it, not talking you know into it, you probably have an idea of what's going on. So. I don't see this being a huge privacy concern for someone like me, although I don't know what you would say to Siri that would be really sensitive, like find me the locus, local pharmacy, or I don't even know what you would say to it. That would be, oh, don't tell anybody. Well, I'm sure people have said some crazy things to Siri. I know, I've yelled at Siri. Tom, Darren brings up a good point that, you know, maybe it's not so much about what Apple's doing with your data. Is is Apple keeping all of this data secure enough if it's storing a bunch of data from, you know, potentially millions of people for over two years? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a very pertinent question here. Uh, because come on, I as it, your search history is something that could be misinterpreted depending on what you're searching for. And that's mm -hmm. what a lot of people end up using Siri for. They're saying things to Siri and out of context, uh, they could potentially look very bad or, or, you know, just embarrassing. And I think Apple's policy here is very good. Look, if you stop using Siri, we're going to delete everything. We're going to anonymize things. We're just using it to improve the service. But security is a big concern. And CISPA is now a big concern because what CISPA does, which just passed the house yesterday, it says that Apple can take any of this information and give it to the government uh, without telling you, without ever telling you, and without uh, to ever telling you why, and without supervision. Now that may be necessary in a lot of cases, but there are not adequate privacy protections in that law. So if you're the kind of person who's just curious about things and you're searching for particular kinds of things, maybe Apple hands over that information to the government and you get pulled in for questioning. Or we've definitely seen recent examples of people identified accidentally uh, when they weren't guilty of anything bad. Uh, it's very worrying that anybody's keeping data on you now because of that law. Yeah. I mean, Ayaz, you should be concerned because all those series searches for Molly Ringwald, it's going to come back to haunt hey, wait, you when I the watched government that movie. gets that. I wanted to see if it was on Netflix, and I did watch it. It wasn't on Netflix. I had to ask a friend for it. And when it comes to my all my series searches, when it comes to music, I guess all the death metal I listen to and German death rock, that would cause great concern to the government. I guess... Maybe I'm just so jaded on this concept of having privacy that I'm just like, you know what? Go ahead. Take a look at everything you want to look at. Look at my it's, public well, library records. Saying, look at this. If you're not doing anything wrong, what do you have to hide? Let the government spy on you all the time. That's not what I said. I just, I that's, just happened to... That's the implication. Well, that's the implication. It's not what I said. So...
I say I say just encrypt all the things. Strong cryptography. If the service back doesn't the, let you, you know, well, maintain you know, your privacy, don't use the, the service. It's that easy. We've seen that anonymous Vote data, with your wallet. Anonymized data can still be linked to that one person eventually. Mm -hmm. That's one of the bigger problems when it comes to this in the first place. So how it's being how it's being kept is important. But I guess personally, I'm not freaked out. No, no, I, I feel that absolutely. Uh, Companies that store your data should be completely transparent and that there should be a standard way to describe mm -hmm. then uh, how they store your stuff, especially as we see more and more like LinkedIn passwords leaked and stuff. It's sure. just like you should when you sign up for the service. No, like do you put that in a t database in plain text? But at this point, though, with CISPA, as Tom points out, maybe it doesn't even matter anymore how secure your database is that like hackers might get it because the government's already got it. Let's move on to something fun. Google, there's, well, there's a link anyway. The Google might be rolling out a, uh, a game center type clone for Android. Yeah, so Android Police took an, they did an APK teardown of My Glass, which is a companion app for Google Glass, and they found out that Google looks like they're working on a game center. Now, this hub has leaderboards, achievements, multiplayer support, in game chat, and for turn based games, the code says you'll get notifications when it's your turn. For in-game chat, you also, you also have in-game chat, so when you're doing multiplayer games, you can talk to your friends that way. There's also a chat room function, so you can be, they call it lobbies, so you can be hanging out with your friends, talking about games before you start doing that. Android Police, though, they don't think the service has a lot to do with Google Glass, since Glass can't run complex games. Uh, the Glass team apparently shipped the full suite of Google Play services with their app, which is very unusual. Google Play Game Center. Darren, you know, I saw the story this morning. Is this something that Google really needs to do? Do they need to be involved in that area? Well, you know, Google's um, is their goal is what to not be evil and to make boatloads of money, and that's what you do. You do all the things. I mean, we're looking at Twitter getting into music. Uh, I I think Steam should get into Twitter and you know, get into selling movies. Why not? No, I'm I'm not serious about that. But it's. Uh, Part of this reminds me of like Microsoft Zone, and then the other part of me is like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's that's kind of the Google way: provide a platform for people to do that kind of stuff. If they've got an API that kind of like hooks in better, then maybe we'd see uh, like standardizing on the the multiplayer aspect of Android games will only make the experience better for everybody, make it easier for programmers. That's for sure. So what do you think? I mean, a Apple's Game Center not exactly lighting up the world when it comes to like it's not Xbox Live by any by any means. Is this something Google really needs to do? Yeah. Um. You know what? What was it? Yesterday or two days ago? We were talking about how games um, are you know not only on iOS but on the Android platform a big money maker for developers. Um, that 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 Android is even catching up to iOS as far as um, the the kind of revenue that people who are who are making games are 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 getting. So. There are a lot of games, and if you have some sort of central system, or at least something that is attempting to be a central system, that's going to um, help us connect to each other. If you and I are playing games, we get little notifications, we're sort of hooked in, and you've got leaderboards and stuff like that. Just because Game Center isn't really done that well doesn't mean that it can't be done better on the Android side of things. Tom, with the Android set-top boxes we've seen, Google TV, OUYA even, is this going to make these kind of Android set-top boxes effectively game consoles because Google's doing the back end, assuming they go ahead with this? Well, OUYA is a game console, and I, I think they'll they'll probably benefit from this if it, if it turns out to be true. And I, I think this is just uh, obvious that Google would get into this at some point. Game Center, uh, while it doesn't light up the world, is certainly something that Apple touts as, as a benefit, and a lot of people use it. So, you know, why why wouldn't you do something like this? I think the thing that Google could do that Apple couldn't do is tie this stuff together. You have a mobile device, or you have a Google TV, or you have any other Android-based television. They're all It's on everything at this point. If you could have somebody playing on a, on a controller, on an OUYA, who's playing somebody who's playing on a mobile phone, you have this connection that Microsoft just doesn't have right now. You can't have Xbox games talking to phones, well, one-to-one. -one. But you could have this, and this could make Google a much larger, excuse the pun, player in the game. Of in the, in you're right, you're right. World. Google's bigger. They've got more devices, and I'm sure they, they you know, would <laughs> do it well, not like Google TV or anything. Your pun is excused. Thank you. I don't know about your stab at Google TV, though. Um, sure, that's excuse too. Let's take a break and uh, thank our sponsor, Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, or now an online store. That's right. Squarespace Commerce introduces a new commerce solution by Commerce Solution. In other words, it's a store that you can set up that 
instantly lets you start selling products. And it's powerful. This is easy to set up, but it's integrated with those beautiful Squarespace templates. Uh, so you can sell both physical and digital goods. It's a real store setup. This, this isn't something they pasted on top of the Squarespace site. This is good stuff. Fast merchant account setups. You can accept payments by credit or debit card. One interface for order management, tracking orders, providing customer email updates, printing shipping labels, adding coupons, and it's included with the business plan subscription. That's $24 a month when you sign up for a year or $30 a month for the monthly plan. Squarespace gives you and your website the best mobile experience already, and that doesn't change if you do the store option. Squarespace has developed templates with mobile-ready responsive designs. That means no matter what device, somebody's on a ooh yeah or a, a, a Windows phone or a tablet of any kind, your site's going to look right for the right screen size. And of course, this means you get a mobile-ready store with that new commerce solution. So you've you're, you're, you got all the buzzwords in your store. Squarespace gives you better social media integration. It's exceptionally well-designed. They have award-winning designs that you get to use, and, and you look like a genius because your store looks great. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform integrating all your website needs. Domains, design, development, commerce, hosting, and 24-7 customer support. For a free trial, go to squarespace.com and sign up for a free account. Now, you may say, well, what do, what do I got to give them? Nothing. Email address, because, well, you kind of need to get your details of links and stuff by email. But that's it. No credit card. Just start building your website. If you do decide to purchase, use this offer code TNT4. Get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. That includes monthly and annual plans. And don't forget about free domain name registration that comes with the annual plan customer subscription. That's squarespace.com. Use that offer code TNT for everything you need to create an exceptional website. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Amazon debuts 14 original series today, uh, streaming in the U.S. and the U.K., and uh, we mentioned some of those in the uh, in the news views today. Zombieland, the series, has its pilot up there from Sony. Alpha House, which is a political satire starring John Goodman, written by Doonesbury's Gary Trudeau. Betas, which I actually watched a few minutes of this morning, is directed by Michael Lehman. He's a former director of True Blood and Dexter episodes. And it's about a startup in Silicon Valley. It's comedy. Looks, uh, looks pretty funny so far, what I've seen of it. There's also uh, one... Uh, pilot that did come through their online submission process, their crowdsourcing of it, uh, Those Who Can't. There's six kids shows in there as well. Uh, I don't know if you guys have paged through this stuff yet. Uh, at the bottom of the Verge story, there's a link to Amazon where you can see these. If you're in the UK, you can see them on Love Film Germany, as we mentioned, getting them in a few weeks. I think these, these look like a nice spread, and I like the fact that they're asking us to watch them and vote. Say, okay, which ones do you want to see? Sarah, have you looked through these? Yeah, some of them. Um, I, I've not not so much the kids programming. You don't <laughs> watch teeny tiny dogs. I'm not really the target audience. I don't know. Maybe I what about give... Sarah solves it. Oh, they didn't spell Sarah right. There's no H. Yeah, so I'm not, not gonna, gonna watch, watch that. that. <laughs> what a bunch of junk. Uh, that one's gonna fail for sure. But no, this is this is great. I, I think Amazon Studios. This is yeah. You know, this is a Amazon wants to become a content network. Uh, so does Netflix. You know, so does Hulu. Uh, yep. These are the next gen entertainment content studios and Amazon is smart enough to say pilots are you know potentially expensive you know you you have you have a whole history of, of television shows say that launch and there's this whole uh, you know marketing push and advertising and, and 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 promotion that goes behind it and sometimes they just fail and you know maybe if the public had gotten a little bit more information off the offset you would have gotten the sense that it wasn't even worth making, you know, 12 episodes of. So I think that this is a really, really good approach to crowdsource some of this content out of the gate. Yeah, and it, it's high quality stuff and a different tactic than I think we're seeing from Netflix. Netflix goes with sort of HBO quality stuff. This looks like the kind of things you might see greenlit for broadcast television, for primetime television. John Goodman starting in a political satire, some, some sitcom type stuff, although very techie oriented. The Onion News Empire, uh, which is journalists from The Onion, allegedly, doing anything to stay on top. I ask, does this remind you of primetime TV? It, it does a bit. I was thinking about the strategy that uh, Amazon is going after, and it looks a lot like the traditional television model. And I'm thinking about the devices that Amazon sells. They sell the Kindle Fire. They sell all of these little portable devices. And yes, Amazon Instant Video is on set-top boxes, but not like Netflix. Netflix is on everything. So you could have this HBO-style show where you want to do this mass consumption of 
House of Cards. But half an hour content while you're waiting in line for something, you're waiting on an airplane, this seems like that would make more sense for a portable device like a Fire HD or any of those small things that, or even an iPad because Amazon Instant Video runs on that. So maybe bite-sized content or traditional television content makes more sense for Amazon due to the way they actually get their, their uh, content on devices. So do you feel like the Amazon... Uh developing content experience would be different from, say, a Netflix developing content? Do you feel like there's a difference in the, the time that, that would be involved in, like, the duration? You mean when it comes to the content producers bringing it to the to, to the company? I know. I'm talking about you, you point out that Amazon and their devices, and you feel like that might, what, say that you, shorter shows are more web-friendly shows kind of style? Yeah, that kind of thing, because you have these smaller devices, and you don't want to sit there for two hours or watch... 13 episodes of House of Cards. Not necessarily, because that's a long commitment. These half an hour programs of 22 minutes or these children's shows seem bite-sized, seem like, okay, here, just take this fire and be quiet, kid. That'll work. Uh, see, I see this and I get really excited because, I mean, I, like many people, gave up on the traditional cable programming and all of that stuff, but uh, it's really, it's invigorating to see some uh, content being made for the web, from the web, but using, you know, that, that model and, uh, or developing a new model. I don't know. I'm I'm stoked about this. I've been thinking about that recently, too. I mean, there there are the the people who have uh, canceled cable subscriptions, you know, gotten rid of their TVs because there's this whole disdain for how the system has worked for a really long time. You know, commercials really bother people and, oh, you know, I'm being, you know, uh, subliminal messages thrown at me and this whole thing. And it's for, for, for a lot of people, certainly not everybody, um, it's not because... We hate content. No, no, I love the you TV know? shows. It's not because I don't want to watch a good program. It's just that the model was broken to me for a long time. And to see new models emerging is exciting. Yeah. Now, another take on this is, of course, uh, we, we've talked previously about Twitter partnering up uh, with different networks. And, and there's another one, BBC America now partnering up with Twitter. Yeah, this is actually a, 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 a tweet that came from BBC America's official Twitter account uh, yesterday said, Twitter and BBC America, home of Doctor Who and Top Gear, ink deal to offer first in-tweet branded video synced to entertainment TV series. So that's, you know, that, that, that came from, from BBC America. So you might say, all right, well, what does that mean? Uh, we don't have a whole lot more information from either company at this point, but CNET, um, in an article written up today, speculates, well, maybe uh, tweeted video would be companion content to programming that appears on BBC America. So the partners are driving traffic to each other. So Twitter would sort of act like a second screen, maybe during live programming. Um, and this is something that we have seen Twitter do in the past. It partnered with NBC Universal during the Olympics last year. But that was sort of like tweets from athletes and fans. Didn't really have video tied in too much. So the video portion is a little bit of a wild card. How would that actually roll out? Well, we've got Twitter Music that rolled out yesterday. That was its own app. Um, if you think, well, that, you know, music and, and, and video, they're, they're certainly two different beasts, but they might be kind of similar, but there's not so much of a musical live programming element the way that there is with TV. I mean, just look at all the, you know, the, the, the live television stuff that's, that's happening just based on what's going on in Boston over the last, you know, gosh, I don't know, 72 hours, but certainly the last 12. Um, this is, uh, a, you know, a perfect opportunity for Twitter to figure out how to tie in video somehow. I guess I just wonder... You know, when it's something like um, a live event that's unfolding organically where you don't know what's going to happen next, you know, a news, like a news breaking thing, that's different than, okay, everybody, let's watch this great episode of Top Gear. We're going to have maybe um, uh, 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 extra video that's thrown out, you know, behind the scenes stuff from the BBC America account while you're watching to sort of supplement. Those are two totally different things. I as what, what, where do you think Twitter's going to go with this? Well, it seems like they are Twitter's really exploiting these new cards that they have they, that they introduced a while ago that they introduced the player card which allows for music and video to be there. I'm just trying to make sense of this First, in-tweet branded video synced to entertainment series. It sounds like what you're saying, Sarah. It's kind of like the extra features you get on a Blu-ray disc. You just have this little extra window on a second screen seeing what's going on as you're watching a program, which would require you to be sitting at a location at the same time as everybody else. I think that's a little strange for Twitter if you want to sync up everybody, although Twitter does work really well with live events. Mm -hmm. So if it's recorded programming, I think it's a little strange. 
But when it comes to things like like news, if you had these updates that were constantly coming in and you wanted to go to BBC America instead of clicking through, Twitter does what it, what, it, what it wants to do. It keeps you on Twitter the whole time. You just click a link, you get that video content. Uh, I, th I think it's it seems like it's a pretty big partnership. Well, I mean, that's the thing. Twitter is live, and uh, I'm not the type to watch live TV, but I do get, though, if you are watching, like, the latest True Blood episode that's coming out and we're all having this experience together, even though we're all at our respective homes, uh, that's really cool. That said, I don't know, a person, I don't feel like I'm not ADD enough to be able to watch TV and also, like, be on the Twitter and then also get additional information about the TV show while I'm trying to pay attention to it, although that would be great for the commercial breaks if you are going to watch live. Um... I just would hope, though, that the content providers wouldn't try to pull off some gags like, you know, Top Gear, oh, what, and at this time now, when you see the little thing at the bottom, right, scratch and sniff, you know, box number four for burnt tires. Well, that, yeah, I think that that's, that's part of what, I, what I'm getting at, too, is that Twitter is so... Twitter sort of spins the way that it wants to spin, right? I mean, it depends on who you're following and what people feel like saying and controlling the experience with second screens is is really hit and miss. Tom, wh what do you think? I think people are overreacting to this. I think BBC America is going to do exactly what ESPN does. They're going to put clips embedded in their tweets. That's it. And th they use the word synced, which is a little weird. So maybe they'll be going up at the same time that Doctor Who or Top Gear are airing for the first time. Uh, but that's all this is going to be, as far as I can tell. I don't see any reason why it would be anything else. It's the first in tweet branded video sync to an entertainment TV series. ESPN has done this. As you mentioned, NBC has done some uh, stuff. But the, yeah, this is what I said. It's, it's taking those cards and making good use of them. So if you follow BBC America, you'll be able to expand their tweet and watch a little video in there. And I think that's great. Whenever Twitter announces something, it's funny. Everybody always overreacts. They did it with advertising. They did it with the embedding of, of, of uh, images. And I'm guilty as everybody else in a lot of these cases. And so I've learned to say, like, you know what? Twitter's actually pretty subtle in the way that they implement these things. So I don't expect it to be anything more than a little bit of extra video. Maybe it'll be clips from the show. Maybe it'll be those inside Doctor Who things that you see in the commercial breaks when Doctor Who plays. Th that's all I expect. Let's move on to Facebook bringing free VoIP calling to Android users. In the U.S. anyway. Now, Facebook has had free VoIP calling in 23 under other countries, but starting today, the U.S. is the 24th country. Android uh, users will be able to make calls for free on Facebook. Uh, you can use the Home and Messenger app. Now, this feature is already available on iOS, and it's been available since January. And you'll know if you have the new VoIP feature, if you can click the eye icon on a friend's profile, and then you can select Free Call. So that means you'll be able to make free Facebook calls on the two major mobile platforms in the United States. you got faster mobile networks. Sarah, do you think this is going to make Facebook like a major player when it comes to VoIP? Skype was really good at this, mm -hmm. but this is Facebook. It's built into everything, and, it's, and now it's in its apps. Uh, okay. Well, this is a feature that has been uh, live, at least for some of my Facebook friends on iOS for some time. I tried it a couple times to make sure that it worked, and I never used it again. But I also use Facebook for messaging all the time, daily, without fail. So I think it just kind of depends on more, do you do more calling or do you do more messaging? So what's the service where most of your friends are? Um, you know, I, I know that, that Facebook with, with its whole Facebook home thing uh, can be potentially more embedded with Android than ever. But I don't know that necessarily that's the solution that people are going to go to. You have other VoIP solutions. Um, if you use Facebook a lot, then I think this is great. Thomas, Facebook is really, really mainstream at this point. Is this something that's going to be appealing to, I don't know, more mainstream users? Because maybe they're still using the, the voice function of their, of their phones, but they could hey, say, hey, look, on Facebook, I can just find you and call you. Yeah, I think if it was going to, it would have happened with iOS. Mainstream users are, are on iOS just as much as they're on Android, and we haven't seen any effect from that. And don't forget that Facebook integrated Skype into Facebook a few years back, and, and everyone forgets that. That No one even knows that exists. I think Sarah nailed it. Voice is just not a thing that people are getting excited about these days. It's, it's such a thing, though, that it's like given out for free. It's like, please use that thing. Remember you used to do this? It used to be really expensive to call long distance, and now it's like, hey, let's give it away for free. Google does it in Gmail. 
Um, and the only thing that I think of when this comes up is just like, oh, great, Facebook, voice. And then talking about that Siri story and privacy policies, that's my only concern. And when it comes to free VoIP, uh, I think people should check out Red Phone by Whisper Systems because it's encrypted and free. Well, Facebook's trying to become everything to everybody, right? They have messages. They have, uh, they have obviously, they have this new VoIP feature. They, they're on every device. They're on even the feature phones. They, they have your own email address. Everything you could think of is already on Facebook. So in theory, you would just say, okay, I'm going to load this up with Facebook apps. And I think this really would be a big deal with something like those Facebook home phones, the first, because you'll have this option available. You won't go, hey, what's your phone number? You go, Are you on Facebook? That changes a lot of things as opposed to voluntarily giving up your phone number, which a lot of people hated doing that on Facebook. Oh, that was no, dude, public. this is so crazy. I was, I was talking to some, at the last Hack 5 meetup, I was talking to some teenagers, and they were telling me, like, you know, talking about getting some girl's Facebook. And I'm like, didn't you want her phone number? Like, no. Why would you? No, you want her Facebook. Because then you can, like, you know, see who her friends are and see her photos and, like, phone number. What are you going to do? Call her? <laughs> Call a girl? But, yeah. Call anyone. Seems yeah, like no an joke. imposition these days. I get text almost, messages almost, before people uh, call me. Is it okay to call rude. you? Well, you just send, yeah. you send a Facebook message, can I call you, and then you just hit the button. It's yeah. all together. Yeah. I Let's say, move on to the random. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Sarah. I wasn't, I wasn't sure whether to push that it button. It wasn't a cool <laughs> thought anyway. All right. Fine. So. You got a cool thought about Pong? Nah. Because everybody does. Every uh, thought no, about is Pong pretty, is cool. Pretty crazy. It's. I'm sorry, Darren. <laughs> See, don't make Darren laugh. I'm excited about times. Pong. Uh, Philly Tech Week 2013 at the Sierra Center. They are going to create the grandest game of Pong on the planet. The, it's a 447-foot building, which using the windows and the lights inside, I think gives them a 20 by 23 pixel screen. Uh, and they'll be uh, kind of auctioning off i don't know if it's a bid thing or if it's just like a lottery system i think it's more of a lottery system for uh people to come up and play pong on the side of a skyscraper i'm excited about this does anybody remember like blinken lights the uh the german project this is so cool i wonder if it's actually using that code on the back end because we've seen stuff like this before with um oh, what is that pac-man and uh, pong is just classic so yes Video games, bigger. I say we turn San Francisco Fog into a giant Pong game. We could project you know, Between those, Oakland and San Francisco, we could make that happen. You could do that with the Bay Lights on the Bay Bridge. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, and then a huge increase in car accidents. Okay, so maybe maybe not the best idea all the time. <laughs> like, what's going on? Pong? Oh. oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Distracted driving because of Pong. Yeah. it's. Uh, I, so, Sarah, no? Nothing? You no, don't care. it's fine. Cool. <laughs> what if it was no, like Facebook on the side of a building? It's with your pong and your skyscrapers. Nah, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> All right, let's uh, take a quick break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Gazelle. Let me ask you a question. Are you in the market for, what can I do to get you into a new smartphone today? Do you want the new Samsung Galaxy S4, maybe an HTC One, iPhone 5, all kinds of great gadgets coming out these days. Where are you going to find the money if you want to upgrade? Well, look at the gadget in your hand. Now look back at me. You've got money in your hand. You can send it to Gazelle. It's easy. If you're thinking, oh, I don't want to go through the hassle of listing and selling. No, you don't have to do any of that stuff with Gazelle. Just go to gazelle.com, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com, and then find your item. Tell Gazelle the condition. They'll even buy broken iPhones and iPads. Get a risk-free offer for your gadget. That's the best part. You can lock in the quote for 30 days while you decide if you're going to get a new phone or even you can go get the new phone, transfer all your data over, then send them the old gadget 30 days late, up to 30 days you've got to send it. Once they get it, though, they don't wait 30 days. They turn it around within a couple of days, and you get paid fast by check, PayPal, or an extra 5% with an Amazon gift card. Try try it out. Go look up your Samsung Galaxy S2, your iPhone 4, your iPad 3. Find out what your iPhone, your Samsung, your other Android smartphones are worth. Take a minute. Go to gazelle.com to find out. Sell your used Samsung Galaxy or iPhone today at gazelle.com. And tell them Tech News Today sent you. We thank them for their support <laughs> of Tech News Today. Uh, there is but one thing on the calendar, but it's a doozy. Yeah, in fact, um, you could uh, use it all weekend if you want to. Uh, Netflix has kicked off its latest original series, Hemlock Grove, 
so sort of in 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 Lilla Hammer and 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 House of Cards fashion, we got all 13 episodes available at once, so you can watch at your own pace. And this is a, a show based on a 2012 novel written by Brian McGreevy. Supernatural thriller takes place in a small Pennsylvania town. There's a murder. Directed by Eli Roth. Pretty Hostile cool stuff. fame. I'm, yeah. I, now that House of Cards is over, I'm 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 ready to dive right in. My weekend's plans are set now. Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> mine too. <laughs> Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We got a message from Joao in Portugal. He says, hey, everybody, I think the Evernote jetpack time machine might be something like a flexible paper thin and paper textured display to be used with a stylus for drawing and note taking digital paper done right. That would make me use Evernote. Love the show. Watch it every day. <laughs> I think it's a brilliant idea, actually doing like a digital notebook, although isn't that just paper? Yeah, I'm not sure where the <laughs> time machine part of it well, is. Well, there's, the, there's that, what is that uh, scribe thing where, oh, the, scribe you, where pen? the pen is digital and doesn't ever know you, buy, it, it saves buy your notes as you write them. Maybe it's something like that. Hmm. I got another email from Charles in Louisiana who says, regarding the story on Google preventing the resale of Google Glass... I have one small correction to make. In the discussion, it was mentioned about not being able to gift glass. This, however, is allowed by the terms. If you go to google.com slash glass slash terms, there's a relevant section uh, that pertains to resale and gifts that says you may not commercially resale any device, but you may give the device as a gift unless otherwise set forth in the device-specific addendum. Recipients of gifts may need to open and maintain a Google Wallet account in order to receive support from Google. These terms will also apply to any gift recipient. Uh, thank you, Charles. And uh, I have a, a slight correction for Charles. Uh, it does say, unless set forth in the device-specific addendum, and there is a device-specific addendum for the Glass Explorer. It's specific to these Google Glasses that are being given out as the Glass Explorer. It says, unless otherwise authorized by Google, you may only purchase one device, and you may not resell, loan, transfer, or give your device to any other person. If you resell, loan, transfer, or give your device to any other person without Google's authorization, Google reserves the right to deactivate the device, and neither you nor the unauthorized person using the device will be entitled to any refund, product support, or product warranty. So that's what we were talking about yesterday, is this device-specific addendum. And yes, in the main terms that will, we assume, apply to any version of Google Glass in the future, it says you can't resell it. And I wonder if that runs afoul of the right of first sale. We'll, we'll see what happens when they make them commercially available, though. Yeah, well, I was about to say, video game companies would love to use that licensing agreement, you know? That's good stuff. Yeah. All right, well, that is it for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, Darren Kitchen, thank you uh, for coming back again for another week. You get better you. and better. All the time, not not at the show. I mean, with your with your. Oh right, 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 right. Yeah, uh, Tom, but, I got a question for you. <clears throat> yeah. Are you are you in North America? I is Los Angeles in North America? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, uh, okay, then yes. I do you, do you like hacking and hacker culture? Sure. No, I'm a good, big fan. Love well, your show. Get this: for the next six months, I'll be touring all across uh, North America, hosting meetups and doing workshops at hacker spaces and in other meetups all around. And if you're interested in participating, whether you're going to uh, help host something or you just want to get a beer and shoot the breeze and participate in some of these, you should go over to hackacrossamerica.com uh, and sign up. Do it, people. It's going to be fun. Hackacrossamerica.com. Are you coming to L.A.? Yeah, I'm coming to L.A. Yeah, we've yes! got big plans already for all, all of right. SoCal. I'm looking forward to it. Do it now. HAK5.org for the show. HackacrossAmerica.com for the event. Also, uh, don't forget to submit stories at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. It's the place to go. Uh, there, there was a, a DDoS attack on, on subreddit today, and I was having a problem with the alias, technewstoday.reddit.com. So let me just throw out there, if you're having problems getting to that at any time, you can always go to reddit.com slash r slash technewstoday as an alternative. That was working for me today. But that's where people uh, submit story ideas and vote on everything. Everybody else's story ideas helps us put together the show each day. Don't forget best of submissions, too. If at any point during any show, anywhere on Twitter, frankly, you say that was a really good moment, I hope they save that for the end of the year best of clip show. 
by all means, go to twit.tv slash best of and let us know as much information as you remember about that moment. Helps us put together that show at the end of the year. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call, leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. We will be back on Monday with Rob Greenlee. He's the co-host of the new media show. Also happens to be the content manager for podcasts on Windows Phone at Microsoft. We'll see you then.